Thank you. So, um, Dr. Nicelio Lemos is, um, he has his MD from the Faculdad de Ciencias Médicas de Santa Rosa, Santa Casa de San Paulo. He has a doctorate in gynecology from the same institution in 2008. In 2006, he volunteered as a doctor at the Clinic of Urogynecology and Vaginal Surgery um, in San Paulo. And then he developed a line of research on the pathogenesis and treatment of pelvic floor disorders until 2009. In 2010, he attended a fellowship in neuropelvology at the International School of Neuropelvology under Professor Mark Hussover in Switzerland. He's currently developing his postdoctorate degree in gynecology in Sao Paulo at the Federal University. Um, his research line is diagnosis and treatment of pelvic neurodysfunction, pelvic floor dysfunction, pelvic and perineal pain. And um, he has many roles in the International Continent Society despite his young age. He um, chaired the scientific committee from 2012 to 2015, and um, he also was the uh, scientific committee interim elected chair for a number of years, among other things. And we're very lucky to have him this morning. Thank you so much, Nicelio. Thank you for inviting me, Elise. You can always call me. It's good to be around you. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, how many of you are there? So far, uh, about eight. Okay, so you feel free to interrupt me anytime you want, because uh, we're going to talk about some things very different from usual today. Oh, so, so, so that I can organize my talk here, at least, how long can we be online? About 45 minutes? Sorry? Yes, that sounds great. And then some questions? Yeah. Okay, perfect. excellent. We have 45 minutes to 55 minutes. Okay. So, before I start, I have some disclosures to make. I am a speaker and proctor for Medtronic and J&J, &J, and I have research grants from Medtronic and Labory. The first thing I guess, you're, you're all urologists, right? Yep. Well, no, actually, we have an anesthesiologist who does pain management here. Oh, excellent. Well, so, except from the anesthesiologist, everyone is looking at me when I'm giving my talk, saying, well, the neuropathy, what, what is this guy going to talk about? What is my role as a pelvic surgeon? And... Before I start talking about that specifically, I would like you to I would like to invite you to think about current times. Because we were taught at medical school that we are supposed to have a diagnostic se sequence in our propedeutics, which is we start by doing a syndromic diagnosis. We, we collect symptoms and signs from patients, and then we try to figure out which dysfunctional organs could generate those uh, those symptoms, and and that that would be the topographic diagnosis, which is locating where the symptoms come from. And after that, we were supposed to look specifically to what or what was causing that dysfunction to the organ or tissue, which is called the etiological diagnosis. So exactly what is uh, causing the, the symptoms and signs. And then, and only then, we were supposed to offer treatment because then we would give specific treatment to the cause of the problem. But what's happening nowadays? It's what I call the syndromic era. So we do the syndromic diagnosis. So there is chronic pelvic pain syndrome, bladder pain syndrome, OAV syndrome, irritable bowel syndrome, attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder syndrome, fibromyalgia, and one of those is pudendal neuralgia, because it was supposed to be a Cox Canal syndrome, and then it suddenly went on to this trend of a uh, uh, syndromic thing, and it became pudendal neuralgia. And it's, it's a very weird name, because it infers that the problem is on a nerve, and it's not necessarily there. Well, for all those syndromes, we what we have usually is the magical treatment, and we feed our patients with drugs and uh, non-specific treatments and everything. Another example of this syndromic era is that 
more and more we get these kinds of questions. How do you treat Fidel on neuralgia? How do you treat pelvic pain? How do you treat sciatica? How do you treat overactive bladder syndrome? When the question should be, how do you assess? How do you investigate Fudendo neuralgia? How do you investigate Fudendo pelvic pain? Because these are all symptoms. They're not disease. So these intrapelvic nerve entrapments follow the same, the same category of those neglected diseases that I was talking to you about. And, and why is that? The, the answer for that is in a matter. If we look here at uh, cervical and thoracic nerve roots, what we have are nerve roots that arise from, from the, the vertebral foramina on a superficial level, and they have a superficial way that should always be uh, uh, accessed by an open axis usually and from a posterior way. So the most severe lesions to the spinal cord are lesions to these structures here, which makes us not surprised by the fact that the neurosurgeons or the spine surgeons who are the ones who deal most with neuropathies got specialized in these uh, uh, approaches. So here's an example. This is a thoracic nerve. You have an emergence from, from from a vertebral foramina, and it's always, always superficial. However, when we look at the lumbar nerves, what we have is exactly this on this other side here. You, you have a small way of the, a, a small part of the, the, the nerve root arising from the foramina. You can see like one to two centimeters of it after you remove the paravertebral uh, muscles. And then it dies behind the quadratus lumbaris and the psoas muscle and become uh, an intrapelvic structure, a retroperitoneal structure. Even more than that, if you look at sacral nerve roots, they don't even, even bother to have that one centimeter of a posterior weight. It's, it's already from, from the very moment it, it arises from, from the sacral foramina, it is already an intrapelvic structure. So what I'm showing you now is the most fertile ground there can be for ignorance, which is those who understand nerves cannot reach them, and those who can reach them know nothing about nerves. And that's how everything has been left so far, because no one has ever, ever uh, been Paying attention to the fact that the lumbar sacral nerves, they have a very, the, the, the lumbar sacral plexus has a, a, a great part of it in the, in the retroperitoneal space. So, what nerves are we talking about? We're talking about the idiohypogastrium, the idioinguinalis, the genitofemoralis, the femoral nerve, the obturator nerve. Can you see my arrow when I point it? Point it? Yes. Yeah. yeah? Okay. So here are those in the laparoscopic view. So this is the left pelvic sidewall. This is the psoas muscle here. This is the IP ligament on the left side. Sigmoid, the ovary, the external iliac vessels. And look here, iliohypogastric, ilioinguinalis, genitofemoralis. And we're not used to paying attention to those nerves. Look how close they are to the surface. This is a real case. So this is the genital femoralis. This is one nerve we are used to paying attention to because we do pelvic lymphodectomies. This is the idioinguinalis. And this, this is the idiohypogastric. So here you see the psoas muscle, the idiohypogastric, the idioinguinalis, and the genital femoralis. Here you see the psoas tendon. And Right lateral to it, I'm going to show you later, we can find the femoral nerve. We can also see some sacral and coccygeal nerves. We have the superior gluteal, the inferior gluteal, the sciatic nerve is the big one, the posterior cutaneous femoralis nerves, 
you sometimes can see it, sometimes not. The pudendal nerve and the nerves to the levator N9 muscles. So here's the laparoscopic dissection of those nerves. We have the, we're dissecting the obturator space. So here on the left side here, on the, uh, the, the obturator space on the right side, sorry, I'm gonna start back. What we have here are the external iliac vessels. You see the round ligament of the uterus here. We're opening the space. This is the genital femoralis over the psoas muscle. <coughs> We're going down the external elect vessels, the obturator nerve. So, so far you're used to it. When you do prostatectomies, you do see that. But here's the lumbosacral trunk, the sciatic nerve, and the sciatic notch, or the greater thoracic sciatic foramen. So going down the sciatic, what we see here is the cardinal ligament and the, the endopelvic fascia, the pubocervical fascia, the white line here, and here is the ischial spine. I'm now, this is the pudendal nerve entrapment, so I'm testing the psoas muscle, the, uh, the sacrospinal ligament, I'm sorry. It's very fibrotic. That's the cause of the problem, of course. This is the, the pudendal vein. And now we have the, the pudendal nerve. You see it's yellowish here. I'm gonna go back. It's yellowish because this was the, the site of entrapment. You see? It's yellowish here, it's degenerated, it's it's thinner than this regular diameter, which is this one, and this regular color, which is pinkish. This is the the Tissue rectal, fatty tissue of the tissue rectal fossa. And this is the final aspect. So let's take a look at the anatomy here. We have the psoas muscle here, the obturator nerve arising from the medial border of the psoas muscle, the lumbar sacral trunk, S1, S2. Here's S3 and S4 nerve roots together. This is the sciatic, superior gluteal nerve, and the pudendal nerve all on the right side. This is the internal iliac vein in artery. Are we good so far? Yes, great. Okay. It's coming through almost perfectly. Excellent. So these are the sensitive uh, innervations of these branches. If you memorize those nerves of the sequence I gave you, I can send you my slides afterwards. It's, it's quite easy to, to memorize them because what you hear, have here is the iliohypogastric, ilioinguinalis, genital femoralis, femoral nerve, the medial part of the thigh is the, uh, uh, the obturator nerve, the posterior part is the sciatic, and here, superior gluteal, and the perineal area, which is the scrotum and the penis in man, or uh, the labia majora and the clitoris in, in women is the pudendal nerve. If you think about nerve roots, it's also easy because it's also rotating on the legs. You can see me, right? So you have T10, T11, T12, L1, L2, L3, L4, L5, S1, S2, and then S3 and S4, the perineal area. <clears throat> When you think about the moderate innervation, is you have the hip flexors, which are premature nerves arising together with the femoral nerve to the iliopsoas muscle. The adductors travel with the obturator. The knee extensors, or the contraceptive muscles, are the femoral nerve. <clears throat> then the sciatic does all the rest of the inferior limb movements. And as two to as four, we have the external you know, and urethral sphincters, and we have S3 and S4 forming the, the nerve to the levator and nine muscle, the posterior part of the levator and nine muscle. So that was the, the somatic innervation, somatic innervation of, of the pelvis. We also have autonomic nerves running through the pelvis. So these are the hypogastric nerves. 
They are the sympathetic nerves, and they come from the superior hypogastric plexus or the free sacral plexus that derive from the superior, from the uh, paraortic lymph uh, sympathetic tract. So from thoracic stem to lumbar three are the ganglia that innervate the pelvic viscerates. So what do the hypogastric nerves do? They are sympathetic. It's sympathetic not to pee on people. So sympathetic system provides cartilage. What they do? They do a contraction of the internal urethro and internal anal sphincters, and they carry bladder proprioceptive feel, uh, feeling sensation. So the, the, the fine feeling sensation that we have, that every time we know how, how filled our bladder is, it's carried through these nerves. The parasympathetic nerves, or for you urologists, it's very common to call them the nerve erogenity because you're always uh, afraid of causing erectile dysfunction when you're operating on, on, on prostates. Erogenity is because they do erection. Uh, they, they're the parasympathetic. So what they do is like they are the sole contractors of the the trusor muscles. They do the extrinsic innervation of the column descendant, sigmoid and rectum. So everything down from the, the splenic flexures is innervated by those nerves. Everything above it is innervated by the vagus nerve. And they also carry nociceptive signals from from the bladder. Well together and the pararectal fossa lateral to the, actually, right lateral to the hypogastric fascia I'm going to show you, they form the inferior hypogastric plexus, which travels lateral to the internal iliac, so right <laughs> lateral to the deep uterine vein, and then right lateral to the ureter, and this so to the uterine artery. And I'm going to show you the hypogastric nerves now. So this is a sacral copopexy. We're dissecting here at the sacral promontory. I'm opening the pre sacral fascia here to, to expose the sacral bone, but usually there should be no hole here. I'm now dissecting the pre sacral fascia from the peritoneum. You see the pre sacral fascia here? And yeah. running over the pre sacral fascia, there is the right hypogastric nerve. Look how beautiful, beautiful it is. And look, it comes here from the, the pre-sacral plexus, the superior hypogastric plexus. It comes out, gives its first branch to the, to the lower third of the ureter. You see here, beautiful branch. It keeps traveling over the hypogastric fascia, and then it splits out in three with rectal branches, uterine branches, and, and bladder branches. And then it perforates the inferior hypogastric fascia with these two branches here to form the inferior hypogastric plexus. We also have the pelvic splanking nerves. So this is the rectal vaginal endometriosis. I'm dissecting those nerves just to preserve them. There is no anatomic alteration. So I'm here opening again the pre sacral fascia. Only by opening the free sacral fascia you're going to fall in the correct free sacral space. Otherwise, you're going to be in the mesorectum. So the lateral limits of the free sacral space are the hypogastric fascia, which are the medial most fibers of the endopelvic fascia or the uterosacral ligaments or whatever name you want to give it. Lateral to it, you're going to find the piriformis muscle. And on top of the piriformis muscle, you're going to see the, the sacral nerve roots. In, with intrapelvic nerve stimulation, you can see this is S3, S2, now the other toes, S3, the, the pelvic floor muscles, you see here contracting, we can accelerate the peristalsis with S3, and we can induce bladder contraction. So we have here. <coughs> Sorry. So this is the 
pararectal fossa. This is S2, S3, S4. This thin nerves here, you see, branching out of the nerve roots. These are the pelvic splanking nerves. So here is the internal iliac vein. Before the, the nerve roots cross behind the internal iliac, they, they branch out these nerves. And the inferior hypogastric plexus is right on top of the, of the internal iliac, okay? In between the, the hypogastric fascia and the internal iliac vein. So good so far? Yes. Okay. Any, any questions so far? No? We're all set. Okay. Okay, so what are intrapelvic neuropathies? Intrapelvic neuropathies are neuropathies of any of those nerve bundles I have just shown you. And most of the times, they are increment neuropathies. But in any cases, your syndromic diagnosis is going to be a peripheral neuropathy, which is a clinical condition of a single nerve or nerve root, which may be caused by mechanical, degenerative, or autoimmune injuries. Its symptoms include pain, tingling, numbness, and muscle weakness on the affected nerve dermatomes. So apart from our anesthesiology friends, tell me, which term in this paragraph here draws more of your attention? Pudental? Hmm. Sorry? Pudental? Where is Pudental here? <laughs> the only word you can choose from is peripheral neuropathy is a clinical condition on a single nerve or it has to be any of these words in this slide. Somebody please. Hey. Hey. Anyone else think anything different? How about dermatome? Good for you, because that's the most important part of this. We pelvic surgeons always pay attention to these kinds of, of symptoms, pain, tingling, numbness, and we don't care about affected nerves dermatome. And why is that? Because we're like flies in a light bulb. We leave on the pelvis. We don't have problems with topographic diagnosis. We usually go there, well, it's something in the pelvis. Then you do a, uh, uh, history taking for, for intrapelvic diseases. You do a pelvic examination. You do a pelvic MRI, a pelvic ultrasound for look, to look for an uh, intrapelvic cause of pelvic pain. That's how we deal with it because we are used to just Okay, we put our scalps in, and we look there, and it's all there, like an open book. And if you doubt, take it out, and that's it. That's how we think. However, if you talk to a neurosurgeon or to someone who's used to doing peripheral neuropathies, like our anesthesiology friend, he's going to – I'm calling you an anesthesiology friend. What's your name? Sorry. Jason. So, please, to meet you, Jason. So, now you're Jason not an anesthesiology friend anymore. I apologize for that. <laughs> so you can talk to Jason or any neurosurgeon. What he's going to do is think about a thoracic problem because the pelvis is a thoracic dermatome. So we, if we're talking about intrapelvic neuropathies, we have to change our way of thinking because we do have an intrapelvic condition, but it's entrapping an intrapelvic nerve, and it's probably going to hurt on the dermatome. So we're talking here about perineal pain. We're talking here about sciatica. We're talking here about gluteal pain, vaginal or rectal foreign body sensation, refractory urinary urgency, dyskinesia, proctalgia, vesical or rectal tenesma. So 
whenever you are facing refractory pelvic floor symptoms, don't forget to ask your patients, do you have sciatica? Do you have unilateral perineal pain? It's usually going to be unilateral because if you cannot, in your pelvic examination, your simple clinical examination, palpate something that goes from one side to the other, then you should cut your fingers off because you're not good for it. But if it's big enough to go from one pelvic side wall to the other, then it's going to produce bilateral uh, symptoms. So usually it's going to be unilateral. Of course, you can have some very subtle retroperitoneal fibrosis that could cause bilateral symptoms. But when you're facing bilateral symptoms, you're much more likely to be dealing with something higher above on the spine. Okay? So then you go to your neurologic examination. You're going to do the, 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 the pelvic reflexes, so the bubocavernosus, the cutaneo analysis, and then the cuteridian reflexes, and you're going to check for symmetry, and you're going to check for if they're absent or not. <clears throat> then you're going to uh, evaluate uh, uh, sensitivity on the sacro and lumbar uh, dermatomes. And sometimes the urodynamic study is it's also useful because it can help you differentiate on a sacral nerve root entrapment before or, or closer to the sacrum or distal to the emergency of the of the pelvic splanchnic nerves. Can you get that from, from the picture? If the entrapment is here, what you're gonna get is irritation of of the, uh, of the pelvic splanchnic nerve. So you're gonna have urgency and the true rubber activity. When it's distal, you're more likely to have just urgency without the true uh, uh the true rubber activity. It's just more sensitive urgency. Okay? Well, after that, We've been yeah. trying some new things with, oh, it should be, it's rotated somehow. Just a second. This is how it should be. I'm sorry for that. So this is an MRI here. You see S1 nerve root here. You see the, the sacral foramina, the root, lying over the sacroiliac joint here. And here you see a very large vessel, which is very attached to the bone, whereas it's farther from the bone on the other side. And this patient has S1 pain, so sciatica. When we do, that's <coughs> what we're trying. This is a we're, we're trying this tractography, which is a kind of functional MRI for, for peripheral nerves. What you see is a gap here. So when there's a gap, that means that there is a reduction in metabolic activity of that nerve, of, that, of the neurons there, which is compatible with the hypothesis of an entrapment. To make sure of that before we, we go to laparoscopy, what we do is a directed block. So I have my anesthesiologist uh, to do a selective block, which is laparoscopy guidance. And she goes there to the very uh, portion of the nerve, I believe there is a, an entrapment, and she puts there half milliliter of lidocaine. If the symptoms fade for at least 50%, then we believe that's exactly the entrapment point. And then we go for laparoscopy. We have a guess on the etiology. We have a very good notion of where the problem is, the topographic diagnosis, and we just have to make sure and treat. That's what we do. So here, is 
the right side, right sciatic nerve. What you see here is the lumbar sacral trunk. This is S3, S4, and S2 you cannot see because it's deep into the endometriotic nodule you can see here. So, oops, I'm sorry for that. So we can have endometriosis in trapping the nerves. This is the detrapment of the sacral plexus on the right side. See, it's very stuck. This is S4. Now I'm digging S2 out of the nerve roots uh, of the endometriosis. You can see a hole here on the on the piriformis muscle. It's a hole I dug here for dissecting. And you see it's a thickened nerve root here because there was an endometrioma inside the nerve root. It was attached to the sacral bone. And to the anterior wall of the rectum. So this is where it was coming from. So, of course, in endometriosis, what you're going to have is cyclic pain. It can be continuous, which means it gets worse on the perimenstrual period, and then it fades away, goes away uh, during the intramenstrual period. Or, uh, 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 this is perimenstrual, sorry. Or it can be continuous. It, it's just better in between menses, but it's always there. You can have motoric deficit. So the first uh, case of endometriosis described in literature was by Denton in, in 1915, 1955, when he treated this patient with a catamenial foot drop. And I'm going to show you afterwards why is that. But that's the most common motoric deficit you have. In that case, we had an infiltration of S3. What the patient had was bladder atonia. We can also have fibrosis coming from surgical manipulation, delivery, hematomas, pelvic inflammatory disease, sutures, grafts, anorectal abscesses, continued trauma. You remember that the pudendal pain, the, the Alcox Canal syndrome, was described by Marenko in 89 on cyclists. They were on the bike seats, and that was generating fibrosis on their uh, sacred tuberous ligament and ending their Alcox canal and generating scrotal pain. You can also have endometriosis inducing fibrosis. So this is the case, and that's a case of post-endometriotic fibrosis. And it's a very pictorial case for you to understand why the foot drop is the most common uh, deficit you have in endometriosis. You see, here is a peritoneal scar from a radically removed endometriosis. You can see there was an endometrioma attached here to the pelvic sidewall. And the patient was in a morphine pump due to sciatica and perineal pain. The reason for that was all this fibrosis you're going to see here. <clears throat> Not all that smooth tissue I showed you, but lots of fibrotic trabeculate. Can you see the white tissue here? The white bands? Yes. Every time, here's the sciatic nerve. We're cutting out this, this band here. Now we can see normal tissue there. And then, when he, look, this is the peritoneal scar where the endometrioma was attached. Look at the sciatic nerve now. It's right there. So I don't have your video, but raise your hands. How many of you ever realized that the sciatic nerves were so close to us? Nobody. There, nobody. nobody? No. Yeah. And that's, that's how we are educated. We are educated. If you take any book on pelvic surgery, we are taught to, well, take care of the ureter. Take care about the internal iliac vessels. Those are your enemies. And all the rest is pelvic sidewall, right? Try to, to, re, to remember every drawing description of pelvic procedures you can remember from plastic books. So if you're talking about like a 
sacral copopexy. Oh, there is the internal iliac there. There is the middle rectal, uh, the middle sacral vessels here. Take care. But who talks about S2 nerve roots? We have described 95 cases like this. Look, this is a 2 this is a McCall suture here. Because we are taught to take big bites of the pelvic sidewall to give a stronghold to our, to our prolapse. So when you have fibrosis, you're going to have continuous pain of varying intensity, of course, depends on how tight the treatment is. You're going to have allodynia on the dermatome. So you're, you're going to have give a, a tactile stimulus, and the patient is going to refer that as a discomfort, uh, an unpleasant uh, stimulus. And if you can palpate the site of entrapment, you're going to find a trigger point there. there you're going to get, be able to trigger the pain from, from that point on. Another interesting thing are pelvic varicosis. We all know about pelvic congestion syndrome, which is that weight sensation, which is usually unilateral uh, uh, and related to the gonadal veins, the ovarian veins, and the, and the, and the internal iliac veins. It's usually a diffuse pain, more concentrated to one side to the other, and it's worse on the premenstrual period. But we are not used to thinking about it as something that could entrap the nerves against the pelvic sidewall. So here's what we have. You see, these are branches of the internal iliac. <clears throat> and this is S3. This is the piriformis muscle. Can you see how these vessels entrap push the nerves towards the muscle. Now let's dissect them. So as we remove this vessel, you're going to see more and more the piriformis muscle. Here's the piriformis. And now you can start seeing the S2 nerve root here. The good thing about, about vascular entrapment is how smooth the dissection planes are. You see, it's different from endometriosis and fibrosis. In, in fibrosis and endometriosis, you have the, the entrapping tissue very attached to the perineurium. But here, it's, it's a smooth dissection plane, so it's nice. Here you have S2, S3. These are the pelvic splanchnic nerves branching out, coming to the rectum, and up, up here to the bladder. This is the piriformis muscle. So in vascular entrapment, you're going to have cyclic symptoms in women because there is pelvic congestion, congestion premenstrual pelvic congestion. So usually the symptoms are worse on the premenstrual period uh, uh, and right on the on the on the first days of the of the menstrual period, and then they usually improve in the intermenstrual. <clears throat> it may worsen on exercise because of increased blood flow, and it's usually related to lower uh, urinary tract and anorectal symptoms because it's usually due to the internal iliac vessels, and it's entrapping, of course, the lower nerve roots because of gravity. So why not embolize those vessels? Well, because you're only going to make it worse. This is what happens. Oops, sorry. These guys here, they have tried it. Actually, they have, this is a large series here from the University of Sao Paulo where they have taken congestion syndromes, pelvic congestion syndromes, and, and treated them. They, they were actually very successful with a 90% uh, 
improvement rate overall. But their main risk factors with the 75% recurrence rate, rate in less than and in more than 75% uh, rate in, in uh, recurrence rate in less than three months follow up was lower limb patients with lower limb and urinary urgency. So why is that? Because you're trading vascular entrapment to fibrotic entrapment. That's what you do when you embolize the vessel. You're going to turn that into scar tissue so it gets better because it trains first. It, 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 you take out the blood from the vessel, but then it's going to, it's going to retract as, as carrying tissues form and, and trap the nerve again. But now you're talking about dissecting fibrosis out of the nerve. So keep in mind that whenever you have uh, a pelvic congestion syndrome with lower limb or lower urinary tract symptoms combined, you should detrap those nerves surgically, not through embolization. There are also many uh, malformations of the piriformis muscle that can trap nerves. And there is this one that we're setting up for publication, which is not very well known. You remember, this is the sacral bone here, this is the rectum, so we are in the pre-sacral space. I have just cut the hypogastric fascia here. And here is the piriformis muscle. All the other piriformis muscles I've shown you, they, they had uh, sacral nerve roots on top of them, but you cannot see any here. That's because this is an abnormal bundle. These fibers should not be here. They are, they are originating immediately to the, to the sacral foramen. So what happens is when that patient contracts the piriformis muscle, he and traps his sacral nerve roots. So what we're doing here, we're cutting these abnormal fibers. And now you can see here, these are the, the abnormal fibers, the aberrant bundles cut, split in two. This is S2, this is S3 here. See, S3 here. So now we were there in the pre sacral space. Now we're on the obturator space. Here is the internal iliac. We're pulling these abnormal fibers on the other way. Otherwise, it's going to get stuck there. Oh, I'm sorry for this. So it's two, it's three. Now, Obturator space. This is the sciatic nerve here. And we are mobilizing the muscle fibers. And now look here. When I move the leg, look how the nerve moves, look how the muscle moves. So we do this, and this all goes to the deep gluteal space. And that could generate a problem because in 25% of our patients, this is going to form scar tissue on the deep gluteal space and it's going to require an endoscopic surgery to the hip to remove. So now we're working together with Paul Martin in Dallas to develop a gas-based endoscopic surgery on the hip so we can do a combined approach to these lesions here. So at the very moment we detrap the nerves, they go from bottom to top and remove those abnormal bundles and, and avoid them getting attached to the sciatic nerve. <clears throat> so in the muscular entrapment, the symptoms are triggered by stretching the, the piriformis muscle, which is hip adduction and flexion. We can also have new plants, which can be primary. So this is the, an S2 schwannoma. This is the S2 nerve roots here. We're taking the schwannoma out of it. You see now the front, the as to the root after we took the schwannoma out. It, this is the capsule here, and these are the normal fibers. Of course, they're stretched because there was a slow growth tumor there. 
We can also have uh, link nodes and trapping. So uh, 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 metastatic lymph nodes and trapping the sciatic nerve. They are operator lymph nodes are uh, are entrapping the operator nerve. And that's another ball we're raising here, which is well, those patients that have pelvic sidewall uh, malignancies, they're usually they usually don't have any indication for surgical treatment, any oncologic indication. But we believe that we can improve their quality of life by detrapping those nerves and removing their, their neuro pain. We can do that by laparoscopy. It's minimally invasive, fast, easy. Okay, so what are our results? We can get cure in only 30% of the patients. About 50% get improved, 15% and changed, and 5% worsened. Well, that's very sad results. And why is that? Because it takes long for them to to get a diagnosis. They usually have the syndromic treatments with very non-specific treatments, and treatment always starts by deep breathing. Because when, this is a normal neuron. When you have an entrapment, what you have is uh, a reduced flow here. So hypoxia, that's going to degenerate the myelin sheet, and then it's going to lead to disconnection and the generator, the generation of the, the cell body. Well, how fast does this happen? Well, it depends on the pressure and, and the time of onset. So if it's a, a slow onset entrapment, low pressure, it's going to take long for you to come to this point where it's irreversible. But the farther you are on this process, the longer it's going to take you to reverse it. So we have post decompression pain in about, depends on the etiology, but in about 50% of our patients, and it takes an average five, five and a half months to reverse it with lots of adjuvant uh, therapy that I'm going to talk to you about in a few slides. On top of of, uh, of entrapments, you can also have transactions. When you have nerve transactions, you have a neuroma formed. And these transactions may come from lap laparotomy. You have uh, large transverse incisions that can distract the either hypogastric and iliunginalis nerves, or you can have the retractors for a long time inducing ischemia. You can have laparoscopy if you go too lateral with your trocars. You can, you can injure these nerves too. When you do an episiotomy, you're not going to do that because you're not delivering babies. But when you do an episiotomy, you can have, you can transect the the rami, uh, and if you want to think about it, you think about phantom limb pain. In amputees, they, they don't have their feet, but they, they feel pain on their feet. That's because the neuroma is going to simulate the apparent fibers. So what you do to diagnose that is a proximal anesthetic block, or in case of autonomic nerves, you're going to see bladder atonia, which is going to be diagnosed by your urodynamics. Well, in those cases, in cases of primary neuropathies like uh, 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 herpes viruses or deposit uh, diseases on, on neurons, all you can do is try to modulate efferents because you cannot, you cannot regenerate those, those nerves. So that's where you rely on Jason. He's going to help you a lot on uh, with all the pharmacotherapy, and don't try to do it yourself. Do it together. Do it in a multidisciplinary way. It's much, much better. They deal much better than us with those pain uh, medicines. They give much smaller doses in combinations, and they each kind of pain, they have specific medicines for them. But they, in general, what they're going to use are anticonvulsants like gabapentinoids like gabapentin or pregabaline, which is Lyrica, or carbamazepine, antidepressants, 
like amitriptyline, imipramine, opioids, and there are many, many opioids. I'm just citing some here, oxycodone or codeine, tramadol, anesthetic, and opioid patches. We can also use physical therapy, and these all go together. All these three here are first-line treatments. This three first here. So physical therapy, they're going to do neuromodulation with hands. They can do ultrasound, social sound, pelvic floor muscle exercises, myofascial liberation, postural reeducation. We can have acupuncture and electroacupuncture together with that. So these three go very well in combination. And then if these do not work, Jason is going to do intervention pain therapy which are uh, blocks, so with bulpy and ropey vaccine and corticoids, and intervention neuromodulation. So they can do radiofrequency, which can be used for ablation, or just neuromodulation, post radiofrequency. So they direct straight to the dysfunctional nerve and electrodes that's going to regulate, modulate the nerve. And if nothing of that goes on, you can use the LION procedure, which stands for laparoscopic implantation of neuroprosthesis, which is, which I call neuromodulation a la carte. So you can modulate, modulate pretty much every nerve of the, of the lumbosacral plexus I have shown you very specifically. So in this case here, you see the femoral nerve. It was lateral to the psoas muscle. Now medial to the psoas muscle, we can see the sciatic and pudendal nerve. <clears throat> so this is the sciatic on the left side. Oh, I've done overtime. If you want me to stop, you let me know. I have just five minutes more. If you if you can stay there, this is the sacrospinal ligament. I'm stimulating the pudendal nerve, so you could see here. This is, uh, I, I rewinded the, the video. I'm simulating the pudendal nerve. You can see the pelvic floor muscles contracting here. I'm opening the Ocox canal here. And here's the pudendal nerve. You can see it. So, so is muscles on the right side, femoral nerve on the right side, sacral spinal ligament, pudendal nerve. So, there goes our electrode. I'm putting, in this case, an electrode to the pudendal, sciatic. You see two poles on the pudendal, two poles on the sciatic. These are the same electrodes that Jason uses for epidural stimulation. So pretty much the same way you do with sacral nerve stimulation. We can test for motoric thresholds to test for placements. So I'm connecting the test cable simulating the pudendal, you see only the anterior part of the, the of the pelvic floor muscles contract, so that's pudendal, not that's three. <coughs> Putting here on the pudendal and sciatic on the left side. Femoral nerve on the, on the left side. You always attach it to the pelvic subwall. Same thing on the other side. And we're done. We peritonize it and we're done. So in this case, we're doing, this is not for pain. But these are the indications we can have for neuropathic pain. We can use to treat anal incontinence, detrusor overactivity. It actually looks, pudendal stimulation actually looks better for patients with bladder pain or uh, neurogenic detrusor overactivity. And we can, that's what we're using it for Re rehabilitation of spastic paraplegic patients. So what we did there was this. Implanted the electrodes to the pudendal, sciatic, and femoral nerve on both sides. 
Same so thing here, Pamela. Sciatic and Sudan. So in the pudendal nerve, we can directly induce contraction of the perineal muscles. And modulate the bladder and increase about the bladder capacity about 50%. In men, with incomplete spinal cord injuries, we can help and in many times induce erection <clears throat> and in, in those patients that already have an erection we can make it better and stronger. So with the femoral nerve we can modulate spasticity to the chondritis and induce contraction. So in that manner they can exercise the muscles. We can do it specifically and here you can see a live patient. So this is a C5 patient. <laughs> So, this is three months after surgery. He was a C5 patient. Look at the neuroplasticity, how nice it is. He couldn't be seated when he came to us. This is after four months, three months, sorry. He's using his remote control to change the program and not simulating both. Femoral nerves. With the sciatic nerve, we can increase tonus to the hip, to the deep gluteal muscles, and do hip extension. So that's the very same patient at four months post op. So we train their trunk. And the idea is to have them stretching their knees by direct stimulation and using their trunk to walk. So they move the hips and take robot steps. Here's the real patient. See, it's not a normal gait, but it's quite functional. The idea is that he parks his car and his wheelchair at his garage and uses the walker to do his day-to-day -day home and work activities. So he's not dependent on help or adaption to get a book on a shelf or a glass of water or whatever. It's very interesting to see how nice it is to the muscles. So this patient has been for 11 years on a wheelchair. Look, I'm turning his left femoral nerve on for the very first time. This is 12 hours after surgery. Look how spastic, incoordinated contraction is. And this is 12 days after surgery. Look at his calf muscles here. And look at the quality of the contraction. Much more coordinated. Every small move is 0 0.1 volts going up. Thank you, Ms. Julio. I have to leave. Oh, Jason has to go. I just want to say thanks. Well, thank you, Jason. Yeah, this is... Uh, Cool. Seems like there's a lot to talk about. Thank you. Thank you. Whenever you want, just write me an email. Elise has all my contacts. So look at this. This is the effect on spasticity. And this is pretty much what happens to to the bladder tube. There was the clonus. At the very moment he turns on the modulator, the clonus goes away. Well, in conclusion, Laparoscopy provides minimal invasive access with optimal visualization to virtually all nerves of the lumbar sacral plexus. And we got to keep in mind that these nerves are subject to nerve entrapments. 
And when, when that happens, you're going to have, of course, pain on the dermatomes of those nerves, which means you're going to have perineal gluteal, lower limb pain or aldenia, vaginal rectal and foreign body sensation, refractory OAB, dyskinesia, proctalgia, vesico and rectal tenesmos usually associated with pain on any of those dermatomes. <clears throat> so the treatment rationale is precise preoperative diagnosis, mainly clinical. We're looking still for the predictive value of that functional MRI and diagnostic block, so we're still investigating of that, but that could be a way. <clears throat> and then you do mechanical decompression, physiotherapy, acupuncture, pharmacotherapy. If it doesn't work, then you do intervention pain therapies and then surgical neuromodulation. Well, thank you for paying attention, and I hope you enjoyed it. Great. Natalia, thank you so much for thank amazing, you very much. amazing work. It's so nice to see something uh, innovative and uh, right on the edge of technology. So um, I have a question. Do you ha what do you do with patients who have a tarlopsis? Who have a what? A prolapse? No, a tarlopsis in the sacrum, T-A-R-L-O-V. Tarlopsis? Tarlopsis. And it, well, I've only seen patients with tarlopsis that were a confusion factor. But I think it's possible that they're, they're going to cause uh, pain eventually. Usually they are asymptomatic. We usually found something else to be the cause of pain in all the cases I've seen. So, so far, I do nothing. But I believe that someday we're going to have to do okay. a detract. Okay. I have one patient I'm going to send to Brazil. Okay. Well, I have some good news for you. There's a possibility that you're going to have to send them just to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we'll talk about it in April. That's great. Yeah. And yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Dr. Lemos, of the, of the multimodal therapies that you described, the adjuvant uh, therapies, which, which uh, category have you found most helpful? Is it pharmacologic, physiotherapy, and in what patient populations? Is there particular ones where they'll do better? Well, all of those therapies, as I told you, we use, well, there is one exception. On, on muscle entrapment, then you can only do, sometimes only physio, physio and pharmacotherapy works. So that's one exception to that. But usually what you do is you detrap the nerve and you do both things together. You do uh, physiotherapy and uh, pharmacotherapy. Physiotherapy is mandatory for every patient. And why is that? You can imagine that all those dissections will generate fibrosis. So you remember the video I showed you when I mobilized the, the, the hip of the patient, the, the sciatic nerve was moving in and out of the pelvis. <clears throat> we rely on that to prevent fibrosis. So all of our patients, when we do a detrapment, they go to physical therapy. We, we refer them to physical therapy so they can keep mobilizing. We teach them uh, sciatic mobilization exercises and everything, and, and they, they do adjuvant therapy. So we always give, when they are asymptomatic, we only do our pain therapist gives them prophylactic pharmacotherapy. So they usually go to surgery pain-free, and they go removing the, the medication uh, progressively right after surgery. And, and they all go to, to physical therapy because it's, it's routine for us. And we believe that that's going to uh, lead to less uh, permanent symptoms. Okay. Thank Excellent. you. Any other questions? Natalia, thank you so much for your time and responsiveness. Thank you. It was a pleasure.